We want to share a little bit tonight about our Haiti trip. Um, in, I was just thinking a minute ago, it was kind of like going back to see family, and it was. Um, when we got to the airport, uh, Samuel, who was the, the driver and all, met us there, and Matthew was there and all, and so we saw some of the familiar faces, and as we got to the house and all, um, some of those people that we had lived with and worked with last year were there. Um, and the whole trip was a blessing to be able to go back and see the people and to see how God was going to use myself and Glenda and, and Brother Tab. And um, first off, I want to say thank you to the church for putting in the budget, the 1%, so that we can go and do foreign missions. And then the mission team giving the three of us money to add to the airline ticket and stuff because that kind of made it a little bit easier to, to go out of the country. Um, Tim is going to be showing different clips, different pictures that I took. Um, I didn't take as many this year as I did last year, um, but there'll be different things that you see. And um, I got to thinking about what I wanted to share for just a few minutes. and. Um, it was either back September or October when we found out that Claude King was going to come and do an Experiencing God weekend at First Baptist Acre. And Glenda had already shared with Brother Tab and I that what was going to be taking place. And I started looking into the children's Experiencing God and had started kind of working through some of that. And so once we went on that weekend and Glenda and I both realized that God wanted us to use that because we were going to be teaching the ladies and the children, and Brother Tab was going to be preaching, uh, excuse me, teaching some of the pastors and the, and the men. And from that, it just, God just put everything together. Um, the books were there for us through a process, and um, Brother Tab was supposed to have like 10 to 15 men, and he wound up with, I think, almost 20, or maybe right at 20. And... Glenda, the ladies were supposed to be 8 to 10, and we started out the first night with 26 and ended the last night with 34. And those ladies, we would start at 4, and some of them didn't get there till 5 o'clock. But when you stop and think, they walked those village roads through rocks and just, I, I started kind of going back over my mind while we were there and after we got home that, you know, we just get in our car and we just pull up, park, and we just hop on in the building. And those ladies, I thought one time, I thought, well, why are they waiting so late to get here? But then when I walked through the villages last year and stopped and thought how long it took us to get to some of those homes, some of those places that they lived and then get back, it was a process. And so the, I... I, I feel like the Lord blessed them for their effort, and they heard things that maybe they had heard before, but it also helped them to know how God wanted to use what we went and shared with them to help their walk with Christ, because Glenda took prayer requests uh, each night, and some of those ladies, their prayer request was that they have a closer walk with God that their husbands would be saved, that their children would know Jesus. So God's at work everywhere. That's, that's part of experiencing God. He's at work everywhere. And if we're willing to be used, he will help us. He will use us to go to those places that we never think about or we never dream that we would just step out and go. But if we're willing, God will use us for that. And some of the things that I saw... While we were there, um, one of the pastors, Pastor Benito, that I talked about last year, he had said that they were going to be building a school for their kids. And in one of the pictures, it might have already gone past, but there's like an L-shaped building. You see the windows and stuff. And they are partnered with a church in Illinois, and they have come in from last year till now, and they've put those buildings up. It's not ready for them to actually be in. But it's, it will teach, I think it will be like five grades, where now um, 
the Christian Institute of um, Roland Matry, which is the Joy House School, they now have five classes where last year they only had two. And so that was a blessing to see how God is working there and using churches to come in and help. And also, um, you'll see a basketball court on there and the kids playing. And that wasn't there last year. And they're trying to, I guess, teach the kids a sport and give them some uh, activity and that kind of thing. But just to see the little things that God's doing that we would look at and say, well, you know, that's pretty cool. But in a land like Haiti, it's a blessing for those kids to have those kind of, of privileges or, or being, um, I can't think of my word. But anyway, to be able to, to do that. Um, and I got to talk to uh, Wilbur, uh, excuse me, Wilford, who is the principal of the school, and he named off some more needs that they had as far as school supplies and that kind of stuff. And Glenda and I had already kind of started pulling some things together, and some of the things that he named off, we were able to take the last day that we had like a little Christmas party with the kids and give it to them so that they could use it to help the school. There's still a lot of needs that they have, but um, we were we felt good that we were able to help with some of those. Um, I was trying to think if there was anything. Oh, uh, one of the other things that Pastor Benito, when I was talking to him, um, they've just started a new church in um, Leogan, and it's Belleville Church, and he said that They've got the sides and the building up. I don't have a picture of that because we didn't, we didn't go there. Um, but he said to please be praying that they would get a roof on that church because they're supposed to have revival at the end of this month or the beginning of January. And so there were lots of prayer needs. There were things that he shared. Um, and he, he wrote in my notebook um, so that I would know where the church was and the name of it. And he put in here, he said, please never stop praying for that new church. January, excuse me, July the 7th of 2013 was the foundation date. And he put on my paper, he said, with God, nothing is impossible. And he put on the bottom of that, he said, do you believe it like I believe it? And that's something, I guess, you know, we need to, we, we see God at work, but do we see where we fit in to where God's working, where he wants to use us, that we don't just stay in that neat little box that, we, there, that we're in and we don't step out. Matthew 28, 19, and 20 says to go and preach and teach and baptize, go into the nations, not just here in Albany, Georgia, in Putney. And... I know we go out of Georgia on our regular mission trips, but there's work outside in other foreign countries. And I'm thankful that our church helped us to be able to go and to spread the gospel. Thank you. If I start crying, just overlook it. <laughs> I can't hardly share it without crying. Um, when they first came to speak two years ago, uh, Chad and one of the other ladies that had been there came to our WMU meeting and spoke. Or was it a tea? Anyway, a tea we had for the ladies. God told me very clearly that he, I was to go. And I got my passport and I thought, oh, I'm going to get to go. But God didn't open it up. My husband didn't give me approval. <laughs> and so I had to wait. And um, <laughs> But this year, um, I knew that God would. And everybody said, well, aren't you excited? Aren't you? And no, I just had a peace and a pride. And sometimes God doesn't give you a, um, a, a exuberance and a, a big energy. Sometimes it's just peace. And when um, Jenny and I talked about that many, many times over there, um, the Lord... owns this whole earth and all its people are his and he don't love any one of them any less than he loves you and me 
And every field is different, and every nation is important. And God put things on Jenny in my heart and opened many things for us that we didn't understand, but we began to gather and pack. And as we were there serving, we understood day by day. And the little thing that we gave the teachers, it was just a little old fold-up bag that my daughter had gotten, and she gave it to me, and something prodded me to put it in there, and it didn't weigh hardly anything. But when it folded out, it was almost as big as the top of this part right here. And we managed to fill that thing up, pack, and run over. That was gone, because we were all limited to 50, 50 pounds weight, and that included our clothing and everything. But God got what we needed there, and it was a God thing. And I can only tell you that when you arrive there, your mind is just overwhelmed with the need. It's just uh, such a need. And uh, there were times that I felt like, Lord, I don't know what to say or what to do. I just love them. And when we arrived there, it was... Um, his peace, his peace. Uh, when we went through Port-au-Prince, it's, I can't even describe it. It's just um, mind-boggling, the poverty, the need, the mobs of people, uh, the throngs going on each side of the highway, and they're like not even two lane in some areas, uh, holes in the streets, no traffic lights. All the cars are trying to go in one direction at one time. And, it's a beep, 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 boop all the time. There's cars and trucks. There are people stacked up. There's stuff on top of the trucks and the buses that you think, how can one more person get on? But they do. Why doesn't people fall off? But they don't. People stepping out of the sideways trying to sell you water or food. Of course, we couldn't, to we couldn't do that because we couldn't tolerate it. Uh, the hygiene, the everything is just mind-boggling. But one thing God put on our heart was we were to take the Christian flag. We were to take little globes <laughs> and point out to these people that we're all in the same kingdom in Christ Jesus, wherever you are. And those very things that we took, they desperately loved and they wanted, and it just amazed us. Um, we had to have bodyguards, and we had to have interpreters. And when we got there, we had been promised uh, 25, wasn't it, Brother Tab? 25 of these books, and they're in French, and I don't know a word of French, except I know a few now, I must say. And I know a few words. And anyway, they kind of just, J.J. liked to blew it. He just, I, I'm so Southern drawl, and he's so French, and... <laughs> And he tried to teach me words, and I will hang on to them N's and R's and T's and all that stuff. And you don't supposed to in French. And, but I like to question him to death, and he almost threw up his hands and quit, I think, a few times because I asked so many questions. But God took an uh, old girl from Albany, Georgia, with a southern drawl, and uh, not much more than just a whole lot of love for Jesus. And he helped me every day and Brother Tab to study the French version and the hour of English. And God would lead me to what to say every night. And we would start and it would be late afternoon. But before we could get through, it would be black in there because I have no electricity in those rooms. They have no window panes. They have bars on their doors and windows. And you... They're just so full of love for Jesus. And you can feel Christ everywhere. You can feel their love and, and their need. They're like little dry sponges soaking up every word of God that they can get. And when you go out, there's no stores and things like we have. And we would find them sometimes they would be out selling their wares. And poor Jenny, she just blew most of her money the first day because <laughs> she had such a heart for their poverty. Um, and we kind of, God kept giving us some more money. It's amazing. I, I can't explain all that God did, like the cakes. And uh, we wanted to love these women and give a party. And Brother Tim wanted his men to be involved. And do you know that we fed all the men and all the teachers, all, all of them that came, 
and had leftovers. And believe me, the help up in the house loved the leftovers. So God has done a wonderful work uh, through you. We talked about you. We shared your prayers for them and for us the whole time we were there. They prayed for you, and they are praying for us to have a revival. They want a revival. They're praying for us to have a revival, too. So keep praying for these people. Um, Brother Tad didn't want to stay but a few minutes, but I just... The peace and the love of Christ was evident from the very beginning when Chad talked. And when we moved out of Port-au-Prince into the Grassier area, immediately you could feel the presence of God so strong that I've not felt it any stronger anywhere in my life than there. God's there. He's all over his earth, and he's calling us. When the men came back, and God was, Christ was here on the earth as a flesh deity and flesh for me and you and the Samaritan woman was at the well and the disciples went into the city seeking food not the harvest not to share Christ not to say we have the Messiah out here at your well and say that when they came back with food Jesus had spoken to the woman and she'd gone to town to say come and see the man at the well who knew all about me. Come and see if he is the Messiah. The disciples came back and says, um, we have food. And he says, I don't, my food is not, my food is, I don't need this food I've already eaten. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do not say there is still four months and then comes a harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. And he who reaps receives wages and gathers, and fruit is for eternal life. That both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this the saying is true, one sows, another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labors. Every morning about 2 o'clock, there was this rooster, and he had a horrible sick crow. And he'd start crowing about 2 or 2.30. <laughs> and she did, I'd wake up. A lot of times I was already awake praying. But that crow had a sick crow. <laughs> And but he'd faithfully crow, and you'd hear another and over across Haiti over somewhere crowing back. And then about three thirty or four, he'd crow again. And he was our alarm clock to pray and to remember what we were there for. We were there crowing. I didn't crow very good <laughs> because I couldn't speak their language. But you know what? He gave me interpreters that loved me and loved my Lord, and they loved us being there and they treated me like a princess and you're going down those hills and there's rocks and you could slide down they would hold on to me and Jenny and they loved us and those children just loved us and they'd say block 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 well that was white you know we're white <laughs> and they want to touch us but the love of Christ was there the fields are there girls and boys men and women the fields are white and the harvest not just here, and I've been many places with our wonderful mission team. And I want to thank y'all for the love and labor you put into our mission team. Jim, all of y'all, y'all support. And for us to go to Haiti. The fields are everywhere. And if we even crow like an old broken old crow like me. And I named my crow JJ because he was my interpreter. And I told JJ. <laughs> J.J. wouldn't even come out and tell me goodbye because he was crying when we left. He has a special place in my heart, but all of them do. Oh, they loved us. And I learned how to shell their peas, I mean beans, and they're called guah. <laughs> and uh, 
it, I just can't tell y'all enough. I just want to invite you to invite me to tell you more, or Jenny, and to let you know that God's there. He's calling some of you. It may not be to Haiti, and I may not go back, but they beg me to come back. Excited to see Jenny and Brother Tab and all of us there. They want you to come, too. But those old crows, there were some young chick crows there, too, and they crow real good. <laughs> but the thing is that God says that we don't labor alone, that others have labored, and we've entered into their labors. Our master came, and in that song well ago, I loved it, and the Lord put it on my heart to say, yes, the king that held the hope of the world received the gifts. But I feel like when we went there with our little old 50-pound bags, we got to lay gold and frankincense and myrrh at our master's feet because of your love and support and because our master lives. Our master's alive and well, and he sits on his throne, but he also sits here in this community in West Virginia, Mississippi, Louisiana, Kentucky, Tennessee, all the places you have sent us and we have went and you have gone. He's there too. Our king still holds the hope of the world and he wants us to wake up and crow and call the people and wake up. He's alive and well and he wants to love them through you and me. And it's such an honor to see a little girl that I couldn't introduce myself because the director and the owner of the school wasn't there. She was snowed in. And I didn't get to hold my little cherry in love on her like I wanted to, and neither did Jenny. But she would look at me with such love in her eyes, and I've been praying for her for over a year. And it's so little. $300 a year puts cherry in school. It helps her to have uniforms. And she has hope. There's 70 something kids there because other churches across America are sponsoring these kids and some of their parents can afford to send them to school. I challenge you, there's so much to do in Haiti and everywhere else. If God pricks your heart, go. Go for Jesus. Take him the gift and crow. <laughs> Like JJ. <laughs> Thank you. Well, amen. Um, we had an awesome time. I do want to read a verse that you know very, very, very familiar with. It's Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Well, you shall receive power, and the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem. And all of Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest parts of the earth. And you know what? Um, sometimes I have and sometimes I imagine you have talked to people. And they say, why go anywhere when there's so much need here? And amen, there is always a lot of need here. And maybe you've struggled with that. Well, and someone shared that to me and I just, I said, well, because of Acts 1-8. He says, you shall be my, you is singular and personal. You, Tab, you, whatever, you fill your name in the block, shall be my witnesses. And let me tell you how, where all you should be a witness of me. And he covers the earth, the whole globe. That's why you go. Um, tell you about our trip. Uh, listen, I just want to say this. First of all, our leader was Chad, uh, other than obviously the Holy Spirit, uh, Chad was our leader, and he did an outstanding job. He really did, he did a great job of, of leading us and uh, uh, through the airports and everything. Um, when we got to uh, landing the, in Haiti at Port-au-Prince, and, and we were leaving the airport, this is the only bad experience. Well, really, we didn't turn out, it could have been a bad experience. Could have lost Jenny right off the bat. <laughs> but God, God watches everything. Um, I don't know how to describe it. Everything's fine in the airport, and the moment you step outside, it is people. It's a, it's a madhouse. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't. It, you just have to go. And it, it is 
people on top of each other going with all kind of different good and bad motives while they're coming towards you. Um, and they want to take your bags, maybe because they want to help take your bags to where you're going, so you'll tip them. Or maybe they just want to take your bags. Or, you know, who knows what they're trying to do. And since you don't speak their language and they don't speak your language, you know, you're really not going to be able to figure that out, what their motives are. And uh, so anyway, we were trying to work our way through, and, and I was trying, I, doing a poor job, but trying to get Miss Glenda through. And then we get through the mob, um, we turn around and realize Jenny was not with us. And uh, uh, so, yeah, that's an oops, isn't it? Yeah. And so then Chad goes back and looks for her. But anyway, somehow Jenny had worked around us, and she was actually in the bus, and she had beat us all to the bus. And uh, she could have gave somebody a heads up, but that's okay. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, we, it was the, the neat thing, there's a lot of neat things that happened on this trip was, first of all, um, you know, God has taught me a long time ago, don't be too, don't think I'm small. And usually the application of my life when it comes, don't think God small is, Tab, don't be afraid to ask and see what I'll do. And I've seen him do that with Noah's life. And, I, and with, the, with the experience in God workbooks, uh, Claude King was here. I just found out that Lifeway didn't have anything in French to take to Haiti. And so I went and asked Claude about it. I said, why don't y'all have anything? And, uh, and I was a little irritated. I said, why don't y'all have anything? You know? And Claude, maybe he felt bad for me. Claude said, well, here's a resource. And that led into when we landed in Port-au-Prince, there was a Haitian pastor with 25 Experience in God workbooks waiting over an hour on us to get there to hand them to us. Don't think God's small. Don't be afraid to ask. And so we had these workbooks, and, and, and Miss Glenda taught the ladies, and Miss Jenny taught the, the children Experience in God. And hey, that's kind of neat, isn't it? I remember me and Chad roomed, and I remember talking to Chad during the week, and I said, you know, they have no idea. These ladies have no idea that somebody, now y'all do, that's as talented as Glenda Wood is teaching, going to teach these ladies. And I said, and these kids and their parents have no idea that somebody like Judy is fitting to teach them experience in God. That's amazing. God does those kind of things. And... Um, and, I, and there were so many things that God, and I was really nervous teaching. I mean, I was really, Sunday morning when I preached, and I preached every year, I was very uncomfortable. And it, I mean, I felt like, I didn't, I didn't know what was going on. I felt like my first year in, in the in ministry. And, and I really kind of wonder if it was spiritual warfare, because some other things that went on during the service. Um, but... I was so paranoid and, and worried about connecting, and, and I don't ever have those thoughts. I don't know if I ever connect, but I don't ever worry about it. And uh, but I really was, and and since I'm not used to that, I didn't know what to do with it. You know, I said, "Lord, help!" And uh, hey, you know, you got an interpreter, you know, and, and they laughed. I don't know what he said, but they laughed a lot. And, and we talked about the power of prayer and fasting. You know, we talked about He is able, and uh, and all these kind of things. And you want to know? And I really felt like I challenged him to pray and to fast. And I had a Haitian guy come up to me. Because, you know, when they leave, they all want to tell you bye and all this stuff. And hand me a, uh, a little slip of paper with a prayer request and ask me to pray. Isn't that something? And when you go on these kind of trips, because uh, God, God it can do the amazing, the abundantly more you think. So he uses you to bless them. But you're blessed. In so many ways. I mean, another thing that I was worried about is how am I going to be able to communicate to these pastors? That in a big, big part, I can't relate to your world. But in a small part, we, we can relate. And you know, you know what God used? What I tell you, you'll say, oh yeah. He used Noah. He used no. I had a. We got there on Wednesday. One of the pastor, Pastor Eddie, sat there and talked to me, and he and he told me, and I didn't take. I, I didn't think he was being. He told me, "You don't know what my world's like." And he started listening to things what a pastor and Haiti's like. And I thought, "You're right. I don't." But and so I went, and I said, "Well, Lord, I got uh, tomorrow kicks off the week. You know, 
What are we going to do here? And the Lord told me two things. Go slow, talk about Noah. So we went slow, we sang songs, and we talked about Noah. And I think this is kind of neat. So anyway, we had small groups, and I'd ask questions, and they, you know, through our interpreter, we we talk and uh, and all these different things, and they began to ask me questions about Noah, and they began to share things. And you know, come out, find out, Jenny, Pastor Benito has two boys. One is five and hadn't spoke a word ever. Didn't know that last year. I knew Pastor Benito last year. Know that last year, but I didn't talk that much about Noah last year. It's amazing when you share how that somehow affects others to think it's okay now. I can share. Isn't that something? Um, you know, and Miss Glenda was talking about, you know, accents and interpreters and da 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 da. -da. Guy can do anything. I mean, he can do anything. I mean, God's so cool that he can have an autistic kid here, send his daddy there, use him, and he never left to minister to people in another country. Who doesn't? And none of them speak the same language. He's a big God. And I'll tell you something else that uh, a young man that got saved a couple weeks before we got there, and I think he was 20, he started, he came to every Bible study. As a matter of fact, they, they said, well, you can't come in the mornings for pastor. I said, yeah, come on. It don't matter. Come on. Come on with him. And he was at every Bible study. And, uh, and, he, and he stood up and shared. He said, I got saved a couple weeks ago, whatever it was. And he said, I want to get baptized. I said, you do. And he said, yeah, I'm ready. I need to get baptized. I said, when do you want to get baptized? He said, if you got water, we'll do it today. And I said, Eddie, can we baptize this guy? And they were, they baptized him this past Sunday. Um, but he, you know, it was just neat how people were being baptized here. People were being baptized there. You know? I mean, God can do awesome things. And it was neat how... Um, in the church service, just how God spoke. We sang songs. You know, I felt like I was part of the family. They do this amen song. They do it different than we do it now. I like how they do it. And they, I always, last year, I'd get them to do it. They never invited me to join. But this year, I, got, I was invited. I didn't, I didn't volunteer. They pulled me in, and, and so I joined. And we did it in the car this morning, coming, coming to church. And uh, it was good. And we and nobody got sick, and everybody uh, we ate well, and every, slept well, and every, all that kind of stuff was fine. You know, all those stuff you worry about, you think that's more important than other stuff. But you know, and I'll tell you this: you saw me in some of those pictures. I had on my Georgia shirt, wore it proudly, and I had on a Georgia hat. I did not come home with that Georgia hat. There, there's a friend of mine down there that I met last year that he wasn't part of the team this year that they paid to work, but he knew he, I got one of the guys to call him, and he said, I'll come see you. He came see me about three or four times, and uh, his name was Fritz. And last year, I used to tell Fritz, I said, you come back with me and play American football and, uh, and all this stuff. And I, I taught him to say, go dogs last year. And it was funny because they called Fritz, and they were talking in French, and all this stuff. And all, the only thing I know, they say, go dogs. And he was like, oh, yeah, he remembers you. <laughs> now, if, see, if I was a tech fan, he probably wouldn't remember me. I just, just want to put that. And now he's wearing my Georgia Bulldog hat. So it's just good times, a lot, a lot of good uh, fellowship. and Got home safely, and, and it just everything went well. The girls did really good. They, they, did, they did really well down there. They did a great job. and uh, uh, But, you know, as I think it was Miss Glenn, maybe Miss Jenny also said, somebody else needs to go. Oh, I want to say this. I, about, I looked over at Hannah, and that reminds me of something. Um,
Monday, there's a lot of neat things happen uh, with, with Chad and him down there. About he wants to get peanuts started being grown and planted and all this stuff. And doors just kept opening more than he thought would. And one of the doors, there's many doors open, but one of them was um, there is a now listen to this, parents and grandparents. There is a 25 year old girl that three years ago. She grew up in southern Louisiana, and three years ago, about this time, about th that this time, a few months before she graduates from college, she goes on a mission trip to Haiti, falls in love with Haiti, gra comes back, graduates from Tulane, moves to Haiti, with not much of a clue what she's going to do. And th fast forward three years to the day, she has over 500 students. She teaches all the way from kindergarten all the way through ninth grade, and every class has two or three teachers in it. She has 70 Haitian employees. She has 12 ongoing missionaries. She's, they've just built and they're fixing to kick off a clinic American Hospital, right there on top of that little hill. And it was only, we, it was only you could see it from where we stayed. We drove up there. Um, you could walk, but it's up, it's all on top of a mountain. Um, and in that hospital, they're going to have a pharmacy, they're going to have a dentist, they have two operating rooms with American doctors coming. And that's something. She's got a garden, she's got an orphanage. And I, I had the reason why I thought of you. I, I, I'm listening to this girl tell the story. You know, I'm from Southern Louisiana. Da, 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 da. And I'm thinking, it's like Hannah talking to me. I mean, she's standing there that day, and she's got this skirt, because they all have to wear skirts, and they're wearing flip-flops. And I'm thinking, I, I didn't see that coming. Okay. You know, I mean, God can do what you don't see coming. But you know, none of that would have been true in her life if she walked by sight. How many blessings do we miss out on? Because sight, meaning logic and feelings, is what make our decisions to walk through or not to walk through a door. Amen? Now, one more thing that I thought was neat about Haiti was... Um, you know, I guess you can't disconnect from this because you are Americans. And you can try to go to another country and not to influence them that America's way is the best way. But I, I think to some degree that's impossible because that's who you are, even though you try. And they ask you to try and, and, and for logical reasons. And in some way, obviously, American ways would help. But you know what that really stuck out to me is funny to me? A lot of ways American ways wouldn't help. But the gospel always works. The simple gospel always works. In America, to a white-collared, prideful man, or to the poorest of the poor. The gospel always works. Because that's God. 